everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. And today I'm chatting with Nia Long. With a career spanning nearly three decades, Long has appeared as iconic characters in some of our favorite films like Love Jones and The Best Man. But today she's here to talk about The Banker, an Apple TV Plus film that tells the true story of how two black entrepreneurs in the 60s took on the racist establishment by buying banks. Welcome, Nia Long. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm so good. First, I have to say I woke up to your face this morning. Did you? Because Essence posted posted a video of you walking through the airport. <laughs> Did anybody else see that? It was like the first thing that I woke up to this morning. I was like, it's going to be a good day. Yeah, my uh, hairstylist, Ursula, leaked that. She got in big trouble. No, I'm kidding. She didn't. It was fun, right? It was so much fun. But everyone thought I was going to fall down the escalator, which was never a part of the plan. I never doubted you, not for a second. <laughs> I was like, she's going to stroll through, look and fly, and just get right on the escalator, no like, problem. Soup. Do you always look that good going through the airport, by the way? I, honestly, sometimes you just have to let loose and have fun, right? I, I was actually doing press on Friday, yeah. and that's what that video was for. So, that's no, I don't, to answer your question, no. I'm very, I'm very chill. Okay. Like, I don't usually get dressed up for anything unless I'm coming to see you. Well, I'm glad that you're here to see us because I watched this movie yesterday, and um, I loved it for so many reasons, but mainly because it's such an important history lesson, I yes. think, for a lot of people to realize that this activity... Well, what was going on back then was really commonplace and that, unfortunately, we haven't made progress in a lot of the ways we wish we would have. So I think this sort of sheds a light on the work we have to continue to do. Um, is that what drew you to this project, is just how still relevant it is? It's so relevant, and I think it's really important for us to commit to taking action in situations that don't feel right or that violate our civil rights. And in this situation... You had two black men, unsung heroes, who essentially used a white man to front their business and to buy a bank and to create opportunities for black people to have loans so that they could buy property. And during this time, there was a thing called redlining where, I mean, you're all familiar. I'm sure everyone here, everybody Break it familiar? down. I think it's important I will, I to think keep having important. the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. So redlining is essentially where they would put a circle around a certain area of land and say, we don't want black people in this area. Or they would say, we're not selling to black people in this area. And it was a way to control where we lived, how we lived, and a way to hold on to valuable property. And so this film sort of says, no, we're, we're not gonna tolerate that. We're going to um, create wealth in our communities and we're going to do it our way. And so when I read the script, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. Because we don't always get to see black people making historical moves that essentially change our economic status in the world. And this is just sort of the beginning and, and super important around the time of the 60s and 70s during the civil rights movement. Yeah, I've been having a lot of people ask me, like, what does Black History Month mean to you? And it means people like this. I mean, these were everyday guys. These were not yeah. guys who have even been remembered in history until now. They were just men who were out there every day trying to make things better for themselves and their community. And I think that's what we need to celebrate more. Absolutely. And uh, you play the the lead character's wife. Yeah. Who um, I want to talk to you about how you approach that role because she is this kind of great graceful, mm -hmm. quiet, yet very powerful woman. Mm -hmm. So what was that approach into bringing her to life? Well, very different from myself. <laughs> I had to, to not be as direct as my instincts may have wanted me to be. Like in, intuitively, I wanted to just get in there and say it. But I think women during that time were extremely graceful. Black women had to see everything, say less, and be there as needed. Um, and we still need to do that, but I think in this situation, Eunice was really um, her husband's backbone. Her, you know, their pillow talks were changing the world. And she had a mentality that anything and everything was possible. And how do we create um, financial literacy for our community? What can, she may not have used those words, but she was striving for that, for understanding, for wealth, for changing the world. And she was a, you know, a freedom fighter. A, I'm black and I'm proud. Let's do it. Let's go. And I think, I think women like her are always the women that are behind great men. Yeah. Were you able to research her a little bit and find some truisms about her life that you could bring into the character? Well, what's very interesting is 
Eunice's granddaughter actually went to high school with me. What? And it was, it was the weird, I didn't find out until almost like halfway through filming. And um, my friend's name is Lisa. She has a, a restaurant in LA. We went to high school together. And so I hope she likes the film. I haven't seen her in a while, but it just goes to show you how close you are to greatness. So it's really important, I think, for millennials to not be so egocentric and stay attached to history. Because as we attach ourselves to our history, we are able to collectively move forward and push generations and, and the security of wealth within our communities. And we can't just be so concerned with materialism and the bling. The bling and the material, I love it. Listen, I'm blingy, I like bling. But I also know that most of us have been raised to survive and not to thrive. And I think we need to recognize that we are here now and we are here to make noise, but we, will, but we are also going to be collective and we are also going to be organized. Yeah. And I mean, that just made me think of Jay-Z's last album, 444, when he talks about accumulating wealth in the neighborhood and how we're having these conversations now earlier and I think more authentically of promoting that in our own communities of like buying up the block instead of renting and all these sort of things yeah. that we just didn't even talk about because we didn't have the I guess luxury to talk about it for well, a long it, time. But also here's the thing, if you are raised to survive, you're not thinking about necessarily helping the next person. You're thinking about your husband, your children, your auntie, your mother, right? You're thinking about that generation that's standing next to you. We now know that everything cultural in this country that is creating huge revenue, we now know that we are the nucleus of that. So if we know that we're the nucleus of that, the next step is to say, okay, how do we create more ownership within our community so that our children can be wealthy, so that they have a head start, so that they are able to walk into a building and say, I'm not just a rapper, I'm not just a singer, I'm not just an actor, I wanna be a banker and I wanna own the bank, and I wanna open a corporation, and I wanna create the next Apple company. Like Whatever it is, we can be a part of that. And I don't think that in, like in historically speaking, I don't think we were given the confidence to think that big. And now we need to give ourselves the freedom to yeah. think that big. And that's why um, highlighting men like these two men is so important because even now, I think the Federal Reserve recently re released some data that said like half of black owned businesses that came up for a loan were denied. So these are systemic issues Absolutely. that we are still battling and dealing with every day. Access to loans, I mean, predatory lending, Absolutely. all of that is still very much targeted to black and brown communities, uh, which is why I, was, I just really resonated with this story because I have a 19 year old nephew who was talking to his little brother about IRAs. And oh, I was like, well, that's yes. great. Yeah, right? Yeah. So does that give you hope? It's like sharing these stories of the impact it can really have. It does. You know, my son, when he was really super young, he played, uh, he's 19 now, which made me think yeah. of what you just said. He played my son in Tyler Perry's um, Single Moms Club. And now he's in college. And now he can actually have access to the money. And I said, well, what are you going to do with your money? He goes, I want to invest it. And I was like, yes, you're taking a book. You know, he, he's watching me. And we have to realize that this next generation, they're sitting, they're watching every single thing we do. So I wish that we had more institutions that catered to us, that really, I, I, what's missing for me as a parent is that place where I can take my son where it can really be broken down to him. Um, but I encourage all young people to take, you know, go do an internship someplace. Go just stand under somebody who you admire. <clears throat> Excuse me. Go and be a part of something different. You can't say you don't like something or don't want something until you try it. And I say that to my son all the time. I'm like, you have to be open to all things because it takes one moment in your life to create that magic that can change your trajectory for the rest of your life. 
Yeah. Uh, back to being on this set. I mean, it's some heavy hitters in this cast. <clears throat> oh, my uh, God. <laughs> my dream cast. Right? I mean, can we talk about what was just the experience acting with these two guys? What was the vibe like on set? It's a really serious, heavy, dramatic film in a lot of ways. But yeah. what was that feeling like? So Sam Jackson and I used to always run into each other in Whole Foods. <laughs> And he'd be which Whole Foods is this? <laughs> West I, Hollywood. Okay. Just good to know. <laughs> West Hollywood Whole Foods. And um, I used to always say to him, "When are we going to work together? Like, I think I'm old enough to play like opposite you now. Like, what's <laughs> up?" And he's like, "We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen." And Anthony Mackie and I were supposed to be in a film together years ago called "She Hate Me." Was that yeah. the? We're sh the stripper, right? Yeah. I think that's the name of it. I don't know. No, we're, we're sh anyway. It was She Hate Me. He knows. Yeah, He's, that's that was a confident. Yeah, yeah, you saw it clearly. <laughs> we were supposed to work together then, so we haven't, hadn't seen each other in years, but I love Anthony. He's got this infectious laugh. He's super smart. He's super involved in the community, and he's just my homie. So when you're doing a film like this that can be heavy duty, it really helps to have people who are pros where you don't have a lot of time. We were getting like one or two takes, honestly, like because that's when it's a small budget film, you, you hit it and quit it, hit it and quit it. You guys hit it. I mean, I really, I really I like love that. this film. I thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, in particular, like just the the confidence these characters have. These are very heroic people at a very difficult time. Absolutely. And, and specifically, when I talked about your character, the reason that was interesting to me is because when she is having that scene with, I think Matt Steiner is the character's name. Yes. And he's sort of living in his privilege. Yes. And I think everything in me wanted to cuss him out. That's the scene when you said okay, to me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yes. When you said to me, how did you play the character? That is the exact yeah. scene that I actually struggled with. Yeah. Because I thought to myself, well, this is an intimate moment. Nobody's here but them. She needs to let him have it. Yeah. She needs to let him know. She needs to let him know and have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but our director, George Nolfi, he was very adamant that I did not come off angry, which... In retrospect, I, I appreciate because I think oftentimes black women are associated with this untrue idea that we are angry with the world or that we have this chip on our shoulder. And the reality is, is we are expected to be so much more than anything else and anybody else in any other culture, meaning our history. We're meant to raise children. We're meant to be the backbone of men who have been you know, fighting off psychological warfare from the civil rights movement. There's a lot. We carry a big, huge burden. And she really want, I mean, uh, George Nolfi really wanted me to play a woman who maintained her femininity and softness. Especially in that era, I think. At that oh, time, yeah. you had to be even more con conscious of that. You had to be conscious yeah. and you had to be poised and you had to watch and listen and learn and then strike when it made sense and walk away quickly <laughs> with your bag and your gloves. Uh, is that something that you have pulled into your everyday life? Because I mentioned you've been in this career now for about three decades. I know you're celebrating your 50th birthday this year. Oh, my God. Right? I can't believe that. Yeah. That's amazing. But I feel like Not you... until October. I probably should have waited until, like, later on to, to make that announcement. Oh, no. Not I like see people don't know. as completely a badge of pride, <laughs> especially is. given the longevity of your career as an actress actor but also the fact that you are now moving into producing yes so why at this stage in your career is that a choice that you're making well I wanted to get my first son off to college that was a big thing for me I wanted to send him off right I wanted to make sure that he had me during the process of mm -hmm. filling out applications and he plays sports as well so he needed me and I didn't want to switch gears in my own career mm -hmm. and not and and feel you know, life is about balance, right? And so that just felt like a good time to make the change. And he went to school in um, September, and I f produced my first movie in October. So look at manifestation works, visualization works. You put it out there in the universe, you pray on it, you work on it, it will come back to you. But you have to be very specific and very clear. So and I'm, this film is Fatal Affairs? It's called Fatal Affairs. And you're starring it and producing it. I'm starring in it. I'm producing. Yep. And I'm my two amazing leading men are Omar Epps, who I absolutely love and adore, and Stephen Bishop, who I've never worked with. But he's just 
such a great actor and so, so good looking. Ah! I know, sorry. I'm sorry. I scream. Sorry, sound guy. Sorry, he sound is, like, guy. He's like so good looking though. I saw that he casting. Is. I was like, yeah, I'm going to see that. And yeah. he's just a kind and just so we're having fun. Yeah. We had a good time. How did producing change your experience? Um, having an input over the, you know, with the overall project from beginning to end to the music to the edit. I was very involved in the edit and the lighting and going, no, this is why this doesn't work. And Because listen, I'm a woman. I know how I like to look. I know what my light is. And I've worked too long and too hard to stand in unfavorable light. You don't know how much I love that. <laughs> because and all none I of care- you should. You should all be walking in your light, yes. the right light. But I think for a black woman in this industry, lighting can make, I mean, can really enhance your performance in a really profound way. And if you're not lit, it can mess things up. You can age 10 years if your light is wrong. <laughs> and I spent too much money on skin products not to have my, <laughs> not to have my lighting good. I'm like, wait a minute, in between product projects, you don't even understand how much I'm on my yeah. skin because I don't oh, like... Oh, we can see it. You look amazing. Do I? Yeah. Thank you. You're glowing. There's like, oh I'm like, God. did we light this for her today? Stop it. Where's my light, guys? I'm just happy to be here and thankful that I can say that after being in this business for a very long time, mm -hmm. I mean, I was 18, 19 when I started, that I'm still standing and I still love what I do and I still have this incredible fan base, especially in New York City. When I get off the plane, it's like, love. I'm like hitting the head with love. I'm like, oh, love, oh, love, oh, I love that. I, and, I, and you need that because California is very, um, it's very segregated and people don't walk down the street and you don't walk into a building and see all nationalities, men, women, gay, straight, who cares? This is what I love about this city. Everybody lives here and people live here. I love LA because I do like to drive to the grocery store and run into Sam Jackson and Whole Foods, but I miss the energy of the city and it's so much a part of who I am and where I started. I always say like, you can believe what you want to believe here, but you get on that train and you see everybody. And baby, hold on to your purse. Right? <laughs> My mother used to tell me when I was living in New York and I was working on Guiding Light, which was my first, my first job here in the city, she used to say, put your purse across your body and close your coat, right? Like, so the purse is on the inside. And then now that's like a fashion thing, but that thing, and I'm like, who's putting their purse like cross body? It's not that everybody on the train is going to mug you, but you have to be aware in New York. For sure, but I think I've come up in a real sterile, sterile New York because, like, all the time I look back and my backpack is just open, and I'm like, ah, I think somebody could have just robbed me. And I, just <laughs> I remember one time. This has nothing to do with anything, but it is a crazy story. I remember one time I was, I was living in Crown Heights. I was taking the bus to Guiding Light, which is on 42nd Street and Third Avenue, or for somewhere over there, and. Um, this guy got on the on the train and you could tell he had been drinking, but you could tell he was a Wall Street dude. He had a big um, uh, briefcase full of papers and he sat down and within a minute he was asleep. And I'm on the train like I'm seeing the, the dudes on this side checking him out. They took all his papers and ran off the train and I was like, I'm really sorry I wanted to wake you up but I didn't want to get involved, it wasn't my business. Yeah. But um, like I'll see, say, say, see something, say something when it's over with. That's right. But you can't I, get involved in. No, are you no, kidding? It's crazy. I'm not. I had a. I had big dreams at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but your love for New York has been reciprocated because didn't they name a day after you? Oh my gosh, they did. I I could not. You guys, it was the most surreal, unreal. Mo I was so emotional. The mayor of New York City and his wife did this beautiful presentation. It was Caribbean Heritage Week. My family flew in town and I just, I couldn't believe it. 
August 27th? August every year? 27th every year. Are we going to celebrate it every year? I mean, I'll come back and hang out with you. I don't know what we're going to do. You could just come to build every year and we could just like throw fun. a party. Let's I don't do, know. Let's do it. I mean, Nia, if you want to do it, we'll do it. <laughs> I'm so down. <laughs> I'm not much of a partier, but I'll come and hang out with you. All right. I'm not either, actually. I'm like one drink and done. And me um, too. <laughs> before we go to audience questions, I have to ask you about the genre of um, black love films. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the 90s was Nia Long and love films. I mean, you're just so iconic in in, in that genre. Mm. And I see now with uh, directors like Stella Meggie, this focus on telling these authentic black love stories. Yeah. So I'm just interested in your take on us coming back to telling these really beautiful stories mm -hmm. authentically. I think black people are, at our core, we are love. We are soulful. We are creative. We had to depend on ourselves to be unique. Um, we come from all over the world. We are the most diverse culture. And for so long, we've only seen stories where we are villains and drug dealers. And, and look at that's a part of our culture too. And I love telling those stories just as much as I love telling the love stories. So when I see, so look, when, when Love Jones came out, they compared us to mahogany. Oh my gosh, this is like a modern day mahogany. And I'm like, really? No way. This is just, you know, because I'm thinking Diana Ross and Billy D. I'm like, I can't be compared to them. But now um, the photograph is being compared to Love Jones. And so I think what we take away from that is, as long as we are telling the story about love, as long as we are seeing the softer version of ourselves and we are humanized in these stories and we are um, grounded and honest and beautiful, we deserve those stories too. And I'm so happy Stella is in there. I haven't seen the film yet. I'm dying to see it, but I know she's a fellow island gal, so I'm not worried. Yeah, Issa and Shante Adams are... Really and Shantae, you know, we did Roxanne together. She's a wonderful She's actor. really, really, really stunning in this role. And Stella oh, Maggie just has good. a way of, her last film, The Weeknd, it shows these black women in very vulnerable, very flawed, very like real kind of clumsy. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it, these very relatable characters for me to watch. I'm just about. happy that there's a young female uh, filmmaker who is really creating yes. characters. Yes. Because oftentimes we get lost in the sauce. Mm-hmm. And we need to be layered and, and beautiful and difficult and complicated because that's really who we are. And we don't need to apologize for that. Yeah. You heard it. Nia Long said, no apologies, guys. No apologies. <laughs> Stand in your truth. And in your light. And in your light. Yes. I'm going to make a T-shirt. Stand in your truth and in your light. Pre-order today. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions. The first from Ron Mar podcast asks, I was wondering if you were still developing the trainer, boxer, Ann Wolf movie, oh. and what inspired you to make your first movie about her? So Ann Wolf is one of my heroes. I love her so much. And um, another company came in and decided to do a television show. I know they shot a pilot. I don't know what happened with that. But to answer your question, I've moved on from that. But I, I love Ann, and she's amazing. I've never heard of her. Now I need to do a little Google. Yeah, she's impressive. She's, she's a badass. All right. Can we say badass? You can say whatever you want. Bad motherfucking ass. <laughs> it's the internet, you know? You can say what you want. Oh, uh, where's Elizabeth? Hey. Um, oh, hey. So Hi. you've been on the, our TV screens or movie screens since the 90s. Yeah. And played some very memorable characters. So I was wondering what has been your most memorable character that you played that still sticks with you even in 2020? Um, I loved the role that I played in Roxanne, Roxanne. I felt like I knew that woman growing up in Brooklyn. I felt like she was my auntie, my mother. You know, she personified the struggle in terms of a single mother and being raised by a single mother. I really appreciated the good, the bad, the ugly. But ultimately, I hope that people walked away from watching that role saying, this woman was just trying to do the best that she could under the circumstances. And as black people, we need to have more forgiveness and empathy because I just recently lost my father and I've learned more about him in planning his memorial service than I did throughout the years of being his daughter. And sometimes what we have to understand is that black men, especially in that, from that generation, 
it was incredibly hard to um, be successful and find a voice that, that felt solid. And with all of what was expected of black men, they sometimes fell short and that's okay. So if you just forgive and try to understand the mentality of black people during the 60s and 70s, it was hardcore for them. And so as I started to read a lot of his poetry and um, Trenton Central High School gave him a beautiful tribute and the mayor, it was, it was fantastic. I was like, you better be happy up there. Um, I'm learning through that, through this film, that we just have to be softer and more gentle and more kind with each other. Well, somebody's having just a party. In. Um, I think that's really <laughs> profound what you're saying. I lost my grandfather last winter. Yeah. Um, same sort Sorry. of same sort of thing though. Man of a certain era was very successful publicly, personally maybe struggled. Yep. But uh, in his death, we saw the the people in the community he connected that's with, and you sort of find healing through that Absolutely. because he he grew into somebody that he wasn't before, right? And also, if I have to share my father yeah. with a community of people that need leadership and that need to be loved and enlightened, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Because in some sort of way, I feel like God knew my mother had it. Mm -hmm. My mother, my grandmother, all the strong women that were around me, they lifted me up. Yeah. That's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. Sharing that. You're welcome. Uh, and Kadeem, <laughs> we have one last question. Hi, Nia. Hi. So after playing Roxanne Shantae's mother, and now you played Eunice, and you're thinking about playing Anne Wolf. Is there any other real life women that you like to portray? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not, well, not one that I can think of off the top of my head, but I do think that there are, there's, I, I want to explore the idea of the generational curse. Because until we really understand what that means for us individually, it's almost impossible to heal. So that, that, that topic is very interesting to me. So I think there would have to be a three-tier storytelling situation with three generations and, and identifying what the core conflict is. Something like that. This deep squint is me being like, yeah, I want to watch that. When are you, <laughs> you, you going to do I know, that? Got, I got to find a writer. I got to, yeah. I got work to do, girl. I was going to say that's I do. fascinating. Yeah. Uh, especially when we're talking about generations and learning from the past and yeah. how do you move forward if you don't correct things. And I think women, we have to love on each other more. I think it's, yeah. it's really hard for black women to trust each other. I don't like to say that because it, it feels like I'm not being pro-black woman, but I'm saying it because I want us to be aware of it. Yeah. Well, like you said, a lot of us were raised to survive, right? Yeah. So you sort of have to work through that. Yes. You know? And not be so judgy. Yeah. Don't be judgy. There's Don't so be judgy. Lessons we've learned today. Stand in your light. Stand in your Don't light. Don't be judgy. Judgy. There was one more. Mm. Um, Go New York. I don't know. <laughs> Go New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. wait. Yeah. Guard your purse. Guard your purse. <laughs> Fantastic. That's what it was. Fantastic. That uh, was fantastic. Nia, I love I love this conversation. I do love this film so much because, again, it sort of sets the foundation for a financial and social issue that we are still very much battling. And I think it's so important to just be honest about the past and how we need to move forward even more. So I hope people make the time to see this film. Please go see my movie. It is movie. a beautiful, beautiful movie. <laughs> you don't have to wait much longer. It's available in theaters on March 6th and Apple TV Plus on March 20th. Okay, guys, put your hands together for Nia Long. Thank you. Thank you.